Good morning, Tia. Good morning from Berlin. Thank you very much. Um, I have a slight echo in the background. Now it's gone. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, for the past 20 years, I um, was in, in charge at Roland Berger, that, which is a strategy consultancy, um, uh, to, to deal with public transport, rail, urban development, and uh, as you just said, also a few years ago in driving the uh, um, uh, mobility scenarios 2030 so that the country and the various transport companies around the country could prepare for that. And what I'm often asked uh, at the beginning of these projects that I'm leading across the world um, is, well, if we would start over, if it would be greenfield what we could do, um, where would we go? And I think the best example and the best area to look at right now is actually Saudi Arabia to answer that question. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of uh, the region Neom, which is uh, on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba from Sharm el Sheikh, a region that is as large as Belgium. And the kingdom has decided to build a city in this area that will only occupy 4% of this area. The rest will be a natural reserve. You will have heard about this. Uh, they have a budget of $500 billion uh, that they're putting up for this. The interesting thing uh, about uh, this city is that they are planning to build the first truly sustainable city of the planet. And in any respect that you can possibly imagine, they want to be the best. And of course, this includes mobility. To enable, I would even say mobility is at the, at the center of it. To enable this, they have decided on a shape of the city of the line. The line is going to be 170 kilometers long and only three kilometers wide. And that enables you wherever and what, whichever segment of the line you are, and you can reach this by train that uh, runs below ground, you can walk anywhere. So in this city, cars, will not be allowed. Two stories underground, there is going to be along the line a train connection. One level below ground, you will have a service layer. And the service layer uh, uh, has autonomous shuttles. It has um, cargo freight, autonomous cargo freight. But on the surface, there's only walking and active mobility. And that is a completely new vision of the city that many transport planners and mobility planners have in mind uh, when they talk about the future. Okay, I understand neither Tallinn nor any uh, part of Europe is utopia like this. So why are you talking about this? Uh, why, you know, what is, it, what is it that we can do because we are brownfield? Well, on brownfield, if you have the right vision of actually decreasing the use of cars, and I'm not going to repeat all of the uh, all of the statistics now here. Why this this makes sense? I'm happy to have a conversation with you about that if you doubt that we should decrease cars. Um, you can look around uh, Europe and see many good examples. For example, Copenhagen. So uh, the interesting thing uh, about Copenhagen, who um, have pushed uh, uh, bike sharing quite a lot is that they redesigned car-friendly infrastructure. They didn't rebuild it, but very quickly, in the matter of very few years, they introduced uh, uh, new, new, um, uh, they introduced new bike markings um, on, an, on an infrastructure that is, that is uh, very close to what we see uh, all across Europe. They were able to separate bike lanes uh, build bike arteries across the city and uh, within a very short time frame they built 1000 kilometers of cycle roads. Now Rome 
where it is always sunny and it never rains, has 125 kilometers with another 150 planned. So you see Copenhagen is really serious about it. And they arrived at a commuter share, so not total modal share, but the commuter share of 60%. So 5 to 15% is normal across Europe. Commuter share in Copenhagen with bikes is 60%. That is amazing. Now, the Netherlands, however, another story, is a, has a different story because they decided some decades ago already, we will change our infrastructure for the better to enable micromobility. We are thinking transport in our cities, starting with the weakest member, which is the pedestrian, and then we think about bikes. And when we're done with bikes, we will also think about cars. So their perspective as of the 70s and 80s has changed completely. And in the Netherlands, they have built uh, so much infrastructure um, that, that you feel in a, on a different planet. Not maybe like in Neon, but when you go to the Netherlands, and this is a picture from Utrecht, so it's not only Amsterdam, it's uh, all over the place. Um, you can see that uh, the country is a victim of their own uh, success. There are so many bikes that they introduced bike mega garages. So just in Utrecht, to give you this one example, there's one garage that houses 12,500 bikes. That's the biggest garage of the world. And the occupancy rate is hitting 100% several times a year. So there's a real demand. What I think is interesting about Utrecht from a German point of view is they are about the same size as Münster. And Münster is a student city, 300,000 people in the west of Germany. And all the Germans know the people in Münster drive bikes all the time. But in Münster, there's 3,000 bike parking slots. Whereas in Utrecht, taking this into account, all, of, all in all, all of the parking garages, it's 27,000. So they built something Greenfield. It took them a few decades. Um, but they really are there, and it's not to talk about the future. It is where we are now. Last example, Brownfield, Barcelona, one of the worst congested cities uh, across Europe because of its situation. You have a lot of uh, problems um, uh, with, the, with the air quality, and they have introduced the superblocks, and they started in a Chample, a picture which uh, you can see here. Um, a new part of the town of the 19th century that is very orderly, as you can see. And they said, we will take three by three blocks, let the cars run around them, and you can only go inside if you either live there, have a, have a slow electric vehicle, um, of course, emergency services and so on. Residents can go in there, but only electronically. And we will decrease the size of those streets. And when you go to Barcelona today, not only in Echample, but across the whole town, you will find such super blocks with pedestrian walkways in the vast majority of the um, uh, of town. They are so uh, well uh, implemented by now that you can walk all across the city without ever being on the same road as a car. It's not a straight line to get from any A to any B, but um, uh, it is possible to walk uh, across the, the whole city. It's really interesting uh, to follow what Barcelona is doing. So, but maybe you're now thinking, okay, that's all very nice. And by the way, I've heard about this before. Um, uh, we are not yet in a Copenhagen situation, but we want to move forward. So what is it? that we now should actually do and how should we think about the future so we can nudge everybody into the right uh, direction. That at least was the question uh, that was posed to us um, by the Transport Association of German um, uh, Transport Companies. And uh, we prepared uh, a study that Thea was mentioning before. Uh, the results uh, of this Delphi study, Delphi study is always where you get 40, 50, real experts on our country together and talk about the future. The results was um, the following. We selected all of the developments that these 40 experts thought uh, were uh, relevant uh, for the German mobility market. 
and uh, we put them into this matrix of potential impact and um, uh, of potential impact and uh, um, uh, uncertainty. Now, the uncertainty is what is what is relevant here, uh, because look at this: uh, as long as you have low impact, that is secondary elements, that is not so interesting. We always talk about trends because those trends are the ones that are really relevant. If they appear, they will change the world. So yes, for example, the progress of digitalization, not uh, far from a new topic for Estonia. The establishment of e-ticketing in public transport, all of these things have a high impact. Uh, demography is one of these things. But all of these topics are very certain. We know it will happen. So when you think about the future, if you want to come up with different scenarios on the future, you're not interested in the certain trends. You want to look at the critical, meaning high potential impact, uncertainties. This is where it gets interesting. So for example, is autonomous driving coming or not? Well, if it comes, it will change the world, but we don't know. Um, how is the regulator going to intervene in how public transport really works? Because yeah, if it was me, I would ban cities, I would ban cars out of the inner cities. Maybe, I don't know. If I do that to push public transport, it will change inner cities. But will I do it? Well, highly uncertain. And we took all of those critical uncertainties and mixed them around and said, okay, actually autonomous driving is such a huge thing that it will change anything. Any scenario of the future needs to think about autonomous driving and what would happen if it would be there. But if you take that out for a moment and you take all of the other critical uncertainties that are listed on this page into account, we thought that there were two dimensions, which is the transport system and how it is built and mobility behavior that are critical, but they are uncertain. And that brings us to these uh, um, uh, scenarios that we came up with and that we have discussed widely uh, across Germany, also with the regulator and with the government. Um, we think right now our status quo is somewhere in the middle. So um, when we look towards 2030, the two dimensions again are, what, is the trans what does the transport system look like in the future? Are we on the left going to have many standalone solutions because Daimler is going to introduce their autonomous driving solution and BVG, the public transport company of Berlin, is going to have their particular uh, transport solution. And Hamburg has another one. And all of these islands function by themselves, but they stand next to each other. Or on the right of this, are we going to bring together all of these islands? And are we going to have one very efficient, connected system where everything talks to everything? We don't know. It is uncertain, but it will make a huge difference to what mobility looks like in the future. The same thing is true for mobility behavior, because when you think about it, uh, autonomous driving, and um, every speaker will agree on this, by itself is not the solution. It can go in a very bad way. And I would even say, if you have intelligent standalone solutions that are not connected, and you have a mobility behavior that says, this is my car, my car is autonomous, and I will not share it with anyone. And uh, we, will, we will see anarchy in our cities. We will see much, much more uh, traffic jams. We will have people that send their car to be charged somewhere, to send their car uh, to go back home and pick up the sports bag that I forgot on my way to work. It will be terrible. So we need to find a way to um, have, we need to find a way to get, to, to, uh, to, to avoid getting to the bottom left. If we don't do anything, this is exactly where we will be. And to see how much to the right and how much to the top we can get. And here, not only regulators, but also can help. There's a lot of things that can be done. 
So um, establishing an active traffic uh, control system. Um, rethinking urban planning to uh, a way that that mixes uh, the right the, the various the various um, offers that are there, ensuring that connectivity is actually really there, um, and that means investing in the necessary infrastructure uh, to build it, 5G, etc., and demand a standardized technical interface from the industry. If you want to move up first, optimizing the last mile is quite important. Just extending public transport services 24-7 is not enough. It's important, but it's not enough because public transport doesn't really get you where you want to be. So you need to think from the customer perspective and get people home. Um, that is why I think that public transport really is the answer in cities. If you think of car-free cities, the only way, of course, by definition, is to go public transport and introduce, introducing the right taxes to steer the mobility demand in a manner that uh, uh, not an over, uh, the capacity is not overused um, will be important as well. Now, I talked for a long time. Uh, I would like to ask you a, a question. When you think about it, how many people do you know who don't or did not want to buy a car because they exclusively use other mobility concepts? So there's public transport, there's car sharing, there's all of the new micro mobility, etc. Do you know someone who said, you know what, I don't need a car because I live in the city and I have all of this? And for this, Thea is going to show you how you can vote on this question. Uh, do you see me? Uh, <clears throat> well, dear audience, if you go to the uh, button called Tasks next to uh, the title of Tobias' presentation in the Worksup uh, uh, platform, so you'll, you'll see uh, two questions there, and you can vote. Uh, sorry, there's one question. One question right now. Others will be following next. But one question with two options, and you should choose... Uh, between the two options. Please uh, make your choice. Okay, great to see you found the, uh, you found the right button. Let's wait for, for some seconds to, to enable anybody to, to participate in the vote. While you're voting, I'm already telling you why I'm asking you this particular question. Because we are asking this question around the world again and again in what we call the Automotive Disruption Radar. It's a, a tool that my company has been deploying since the year uh, 2017. Um, and we're asking this in 18 countries across the globe. In each of these countries, 1,000 people. It's not the only question we're asking. We're asking about uh, 26 indicators. And I brought you a few of these questions today. Uh, this is very interesting because here you can see that Estonia seems to be in the direction of um, about two-thirds knowing people who actually do not uh, buy a car or did not want to buy a car because of other solutions. Can we go back to the presentation, please? Um, you can, in the deck that uh, is there, you will have access to all of the data. You just will um, copy this QR code and then you can see all of the results. But maybe this is interesting. This is how uh, other people have answered. Very much in the average, like you just did. 65% on average uh, say that that is the case. Now, this is from January 2021. This is how it was in the past. And only over the last year, we do this survey every six months, we see that 
10 percentage points more people more are answering this question with with yes actually uh, things are moving in a certain direction doesn't it i think we're living in a very interesting time when it comes to the emergence of new mobility and how we change the face of our city now i know that at the heart of all of the discussions around new mobility, there is autonomous driving. And that is, that is correct because the critical uncertainty that you can uh, possibly think of uh, is autonomous driving. And uh, the things that are uh, uncertain is technology, is infrastructure, is regulation, but then also will people actually accept this and drive in this? Very quickly, as a reminder, there's many features on the various levels, uh, one to five, that need to come along to actually make this happen. And we're moving through these features uh, while approaching fully autonomous uh, uh, transport. Um, uh, we have forecast for the next five years how quickly until 2025 we will see autonomous driving coming up and only the very dark red button is where it gets interesting. You see in a few years, we still think it is 1% or less than 1% across the globe uh, that we will have moved there. But as you can see from how the colors move, how the gray box gets uh, smaller and the red boxes get larger, uh, that uh, uh, we will see more and more of the levels um, uh, especially level three that is uh, that is coming up more and more. And that will teach people uh, that autonomous features in cars are interesting and can be trusted. Also, uh, we are looking regularly at the emergence of public test roads. And just between 2017 and, 2000, uh, and 2021, uh, we have seen, as you can see on the graph here, that this is popping up more and more areas uh, are given over to, to let's try this out and let's see how this works. The same is true, although not as much exploding when it comes to the approval process for L4 and L5. So we're, we're getting there. Countries, uh, the United States, Singapore, also the UK are the front runners who are really pushing for regulation. Uh, this is January 2021. Germany will also uh, move up further. We have just passed a law um, on level four driving. When you think about it from a um, regulator's point of view, uh, allowing public test roads and um, uh, is, is not the only thing. The, the decisions that you need to take um, are uh, manifold. A lot of people discuss the liability topic. Uh, this is where you can have the good examples of should the car decide to uh, hit a bike driver or hit a pedestrian in case somebody needs to be hit, all of these topics. But there's many more things, as you can see on this page, that need to be solved in regulation. And there's different approaches. So the Europeans ask for a front type certification, where the US says you can self-certify. Uh, there's so just to take the first line here as an example. So there's many things to think about, and you will receive if you're interested this presentation to come back uh, to also this page. The whole game around autonomous driving, and that is something that that uh, I ask my clients always to keep into in in the back of their minds, is to build an ecosystem that brings together all of the various players that are necessary to really make it happen. And I'm saying that is a game because this is a race for competition that is going on right now. So the cities in the Middle East, Qatar, Dubai, but also Tokyo, Singapore, Los Angeles, um, and uh, as of uh, recently also Germany, Many others are competing to bring together the right ecosystem uh, that will actually uh, allow this. And this is not only about, I want to be first because then I get a medal. This is about, I want to be first because I want to attract the investment and attract the talent uh, that is necessary to really make it happen. Let me ask you again, let's do another uh, survey. 
would you actually use such a mobility service? So uh, you have followed this, I'm sure, over the past already. If there would be autonomous driving taxis without a driver in the vehicle, it's really just you. There's not even a steering wheel. It's really something like this here. Would you use such a service yourself? Tia, can you lead us into... Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> yes, happy to contribute. We already have four yeses. <laughs> Happy to contribute again. Uh, you, you'll go to the same place in the in the agenda. Next to the title of uh, Tobias' presentation, there's a button called Tasks. You press it, and there's another question. And you can choose between yes and no. Please make your choice. While we're waiting uh, uh, that you're voting, um, the first autonomous system that uh, I discussed in my work life was the autonomous metro in the autonomous underground in Munich that was built during um, the Olympic Games in the 70s. While nowadays it is quite clear that of course people get into such a train, Back then, everything had been prepared to actually build it uh, in a fully autonomous way, um, but they had to reintroduce drivers because people just didn't accept that. People would not get on a train without a driver. And this is a train, so fixed track, uh, no oncoming traffic, in the underground, so nobody can cross uh, the track. Uh, so the acceptance of such a system, as it seems to be here, very, very high in the, uh, with, with you, the participants, uh, is, is paramount. This is really, really important. So let's go back to the presentation and I will show you what the world is answering um, on this question. Um, and you can see this here by region compared, I have only three minutes to go, compared um, between July 2019, and that is before the pandemic, and uh, September 2020, that is in the middle of the pandemic. And you can see that actually the blue bar, yes, I would use this, is rising a bit. Let's take a look a little bit closer. Um, it is when you compare the different areas where people live, in the city centers, it is the, the acceptance is highest. And you might think, well, yes, of course, because this is where everybody thinks about these things. But the most interesting areas probably to bring autonomous driving to life will be the rural areas, because this is where you don't have public transport. This is where you have a lot of car usage. So if we want to get rid of cars, cars that go into our city centers from the outside producing the traffic jams, we need to think about rural areas as well and increase acceptance here. That is an important point also for regulators. And one last thing, for everybody who said yes to this answer, we had a follow-up question and we asked, well, why? Why did you say yes? And through all of the time that we asked this question from 2018 to 20, you see the results here, people say, well, we think the technology is, is there and it's proven, we feel safe. But this uh, number is decreasing. So the question about technology is not that important anymore. We also ask the people for the reasons for no. And here in the third line, you can see that the fear that the technology is not working is decreasing. So technology is not the bottleneck in acceptance behavior. I do not have the time left because I spoke too long uh, to run you through the third question, but maybe you can, without going to the survey, think about it briefly. Would you still buy a car if fully autonomous robocabs could be used at lower cost per trip compared to your own car? So if somebody would prove to you, if you do not have a car, every trip will be cheaper if you use this, this kind of a system, would you then not buy a car. We asked this, we would like to see 
um, a lot of blue bars here, right? So we would like people to say, no, I don't need to buy a car. And in January 2020, so we did the survey end of 2019, right before COVID, 45% of people said, well, yes, if that is the case, I would not buy a car. But when we asked again one year later, after one year of the pandemic, this number has dropped. So it is not a sure thing. It is not clear. We need to take common and joint action to go forward in the, in the right direction. And I thank you very much, not only for listening for, uh, to me for such a long time, but also for becoming active, for taking uh, the responsibility and uh, the opportunities that you have to indeed change and change the mobility uh, of the future and nudge the country and nudge all of us into the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tobias, for this wonderful presentation. Lots of insights and also lots of practical advice. So very appreciated. And, and thank you for, for, uh, for staying in time so, so well. Um, I did my best. <laughs> indeed, yeah, you succeeded. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, I um, encourage the audience to, to pose more questions. We've got one at the moment, but there's still time if you want to ask Tobias. So please um, write your question in, in the, in the Q&A section. Uh, but this one question, <clears throat> which has received many votes, <clears throat> is that uh, uh, in the beginning of your presentation, you talked about uh, you know, scooters and, and bicycles and the efforts that uh, Netherlands, Denmark, also Barcelona has done to, to encourage uh, this type of move, moving or mobility. Uh, do you think this is a solution for, um, for, for, for every country, regardless of the climate? Uh, the question is that uh, if the roads are icy and, uh, I mean, it's raining and, and you might face some um, <clears throat> serious um, health risks uh, when using the micromobility solutions. Yes, so uh, I think uh, this, this question comes up uh, again and again. Let me come to IC uh, in a minute. Uh, rain is no reason to not use micromobility. Uh, and you can see that in Copenhagen. It does rain a lot in Copenhagen. It does rain a lot in uh, the Netherlands, actually. Uh, and people still are using this. So uh, in German, we have the verb, there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing, right? Um, when you come to a city like Leiden uh, or Utrecht, downtown feels in the vast majority of streets like a pedestrian zone. There's a lot of things happening, but most of it, not all of it, but most of it is micromobility. And um, uh, I think in, in even when, when rain is falling, this is a very uh, good solution. Now, when uh, uh, you come to a city like, uh, I've been to Tallinn several times, but always in the summer, but I have been to Helsinki uh, in the winter, and I know that I don't, uh, wouldn't want to take a bike. I saw a lot of people taking bikes with spikes, but yes, there is a health uh, issue involved in, as well. Micromobility will not be the only solution. Uh, it may be in Saudi Arabia, uh, but even there, only on the surface. There is the second layer in Neon, right? With the, with the public transport shuttles. So micromobility, I think, needs to be part of a wider public transport uh, system. And uh, this, this system uh, will be enough to transport, to, to meet the mobility needs of everybody. We do not need as many vehicles in the city as we have today. We are putting uh, metal junk on our roads, to put it very clearly. You see that I'm not someone who comes from the automotive uh, background, but from the public uh, transport background. We are allowing, we are allowing um, public space to be used by individuals and we are foregoing the opportunities to think from the community as a whole when it comes to defining who needs, uh, who is using uh, public transport or not, uh, who is using the, the public infrastructure uh, or not. Um, I believe that uh, you will hear about Oslo uh, in a few minutes 
Um, and they have done a very well-renowned uh, and known study, very interesting uh, to look at, uh, that will answer this question more clearly. So if then you have a public transport system that is actually meeting the demand of everybody, you can complement with micromobility um, and have a very good offer for everybody. Well, thank you. Our, our, our time is up, but I would like to have a, a very short question uh, still. What has happened in Germany as a result of your work? You mentioned that uh, uh, the regulator um, has... Um, has got to know about what, you, what you've been done and, and what has been the, uh, the response and is there any policy action uh, initiated? So we did the study uh, four years ago and I would say it is still, it remains to be true. I'm using these scenarios in many of my conversations and uh, it is, um, uh, it, it remains, it remains um, necessary to think about it and to talk about it in this way, but there have been a few changes in policy uh, that are notable and that make especially the mobility behavior um, less uncertain <laughs> because uh, sharing the, the uh, new um, the, the new product ideas of companies, to allow for, not for car sharing, but for ride pooling. So really driving together, using more seats in one vehicle than you normally would do, um, has increased because the government has now allowed it. For a long time, okay. taxis were not allowed to take a second passenger who is also going to the airport. So you ask a taxi to go to the airport, but then two streets later, somebody also wants to go. You cannot pick them up as well. Uh, but then there were first uh, ideas, you know, let's try this. We only limit it to two years and let's see how it comes. Well, the result was so positive that now there is a law as of this year, March of this year, that allows such, uh, such actions and all of a sudden, on-demand shuttles like Clever Shuttle, Moya in Hamburg, uh, Bergkönig in Berlin, etc., have the legal basis that they can build something that is not only a pilot, mm -hmm. but that can move forward. And that includes taxis. So yes, things are moving into the right direction. Well, thank you so much. Very encouraging and great to see that small changes in regulation may trigger a lot of, uh, lot of change. Thank you so much. Uh, I have to wrap up now, but uh, wish you all the best in, uh, in your work and, and thanks for finding time to join us today.